Welcome to Upstream. I'm Shane Morris. Chuck Colson's co-conspirator, Father Richard John Newhouse, once famously quipped that when he met God, he expected to meet him as an American. Well, this saying can strike some of us as puzzling and even a little bit provincial. Aren't we taught that the gospel is bigger than just one nation? Isn't that what Paul writes in Galatians 3, that there is neither Jew nor Greek, for we are all one in Christ Jesus. What could we possibly mean then by talking of a redeemed nation? Where does the Bible say that God is in the business of saving nations or of preserving national identity? Can God redeem this nation, America? Does he even want to? And what would that look like? That's what I want to talk with Oz Guinness today about on Upstream. Um, he's a very special guest. He's the author and social critic at the center of just so many uh, exciting and helpful books. He's actually the great, 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 three greats, right? Grandson of Dublin brewer Arthur Guinness and the author of numerous books, including The Call, The Time for Truth, Unspeakable, A Free People's Suicide, and The Magna Carta of Humanity. He holds a doctorate of philosophy in social science from Oriel College, Oxford, and he's been a regular speaker at the Colson Center's annual Wilberforce Weekend Conferences for years now. Today, we're recording in person at the 2022 Wilberforce Weekend in Orlando, Florida. Oz Guinness, welcome to Upstream. Thanks for having me, Shane. Great privilege. How do you think most people hear Father Newhouse's statement, and what do you think he actually meant by it? Well, I think it's unexceptional. We're going to meet the Lord as we are. Some people will be Americans and some Chinese. Some will be right-handed, some left-handed. Some will be short, some will be tall. We're going to meet the Lord as we are. And that means we've been shaped. You know, Abraham is called to break with his country, culture, and kin, Genesis 12. And obviously we're shaped by these things very much, and so we'll meet the Lord that way. My background is Irish, and that's the way I will meet the Lord. Someone asks you whether God is in the business of redeeming nations, not just individuals from nations. How would you answer, and what scriptures and Christian doctrines would you ground your answer in? Well, I put it more that he's redeeming people, and they're part of his kingdom. So we're the city of God in the middle of the city of man. But it's not, we've got to get it very, very careful. You've even had notions like America being a redeemer nation and so on, right. which I think is an extremely dangerous notion. But we've got to wrestle with the fact of redeeming because America now has a very simple problem. The record, the history of slavery and racism and the unaddressed guilt is swilling around, not just in the broad culture where it's open to exploitation by the radical left, but also in the church. You know, uh, coming from Europe, I'm startled. My family were friends and supporters of William Wilberforce. Every English and Irish evangelical is proud that evangelicals led the abolition of slavery. We have no guilt. We have gratitude and pride. But you come to this country and people are barely aware of the evangelical leadership, let alone Wilberforce. I mean, you take the color, you know, that book on the color of your whatever. His page on Wilberforce is abominable, more like a Marxist critique of Wilberforce. Whereas you come here and the guilt is still very heavy. So the American church and America as a nation needs to redress that. I think a lot of Christians, when we approach the idea that God could um, have a redemptive purpose for nations, the kind of purpose you're describing, we run up against this set of doctrines that we have in our heads, but we haven't really defined very thoroughly. And, and, and I'm thinking of Augustine's two cities, the idea that there's a city of God that is always growing up alongside and competing with the, the city of man. And we, we tend to conflate nations with the city of man. Is that a valid way to look at it, or is that not what Augustine means? And then how would we relate that to another concept like the two kingdoms um, in, say, Luther's theology? 
Well, I put it more that American evangelicals in particular have made redemption individual and spiritual. Whereas clearly, if you go back to the beginning, say Yom Kippur, the Day of Atonement, it is instituted because of Israel's offense with the golden calf. So undoubtedly, it has an individual element too, people making their guilt offerings through sacrifice. But it was the nation as a whole that needed atoning in Israel. And certainly America needs to consider it very seriously in terms of the nation. As Americans, you know, you're saying this, as Americans, we um, have this paradoxical national pride, but also this hyper-individualism, right? We're, we're just such an individualistic people. We think of ourselves as um, sort of don't tread on me loners, right? And that makes it hard for us to grasp the concept of communal responsibility, the idea that we could be um, g- corporately responsible as a nation for good things and bad things alike, that there's an identity that sort of encompasses all of us. And so we read words from even some of our great leaders. I'm thinking of Abraham Lincoln, for example, and he speaks in these very communal terms as if the nation itself is guilty of slavery, as if the nation itself is um, being dealt with in some kind of providential way over the course of the Civil War. How would you describe the correct way to, um, to parse out corporate responsibility and what are some of the pitfalls we need to look out there, look out for there? I'm not sure I could disagree. You take a theologian to do that properly. But I would just say Americans flatter themselves as rugged individualists. From the outside, you're equally a nation of conformists. And you know the idea, say, of Rene Girard and many others, that at the heart of things is mimesis. We not only desire, we desire what other people desire. So the whole of American advertising is based on that, getting people to desire what other people desire and therefore buy it. But the same is true in politics. You know, the, I often say, you know the old saying, damn the polls, think for yourself. You know, if you see 51%, maybe we're on the wrong side of history. Now that sort of thinking, Americans are incredibly other-directed. So you've got to recognize that some are ruggedly individualistic, but actually many, many Americans are highly conformist and they join in with the crowds. And that's very much part of what's happening, say, with the radical left today and even the opposition to it. So we've got to be careful. Now, as Christians, we're called to be salt and light. So regardless of whether we're a minority or whether we're a majority, we shape the consensus. You know, we are a creative minority. That's what Arnold Toynbee used to call it, a creative minority. And any culture depends on that. So when the gospel is really salty and light-bearing, it can produce a Christian consensus and a Christian nation to some extent. Now, you look at any one of us individually. We are the embodiment, for better or worse, of our faith in Jesus. Now, sometimes it's for the better. You take people we admire, like John Paul II, or people we are embarrassed by, take the scandals that are happening currently. In other words, we are individually an embodiment of the faith that we espouse, but so is a culture. And so what is Western civilization? It's basically the product of Christendom, for better or worse. Obviously, in some places, it's done incredibly well. In other places, it's done incredibly badly. But the fact that Christendom failed is no more bad than, say, an individual suffering scandal. And so we've got to recognize that. We're all an embodiment of something, for better or worse. We better make sure that we bring glory to the Lord's name by the way we live and not shame. You know, the biblical word is to profane. You profane my name by the way you live unjustly. For example, we've got to bring glory to his name by the way we live well, by embodying the faith well. But that's individual and collective. 
you, you use the term Christian nation, and that's one that's been kind of in dispute in recent years. I remember, you know, uh, President Barack Obama said that we're no longer a Christian nation. Uh, and I think he added, if we, if we ever were, right? What does, in the American context especially, and, and as an outside observer um, of the whole American project, um, what does Christian nation mean well, for Americans? Up, Back up. Just take the na- notion of nation before you talk. Sure. Christian nation. In other words, I follow George Orwell roughly. Patriotism is good. We all live in a place which we love, and that's right. We need a place. The Wendell Berry style. That's patriotism, and you can love a place. It doesn't mean you don't see its faults, but there's a proper love of a place. That's patriotism. Nationalism is the idolatry of that. And that's very dangerous because that becomes an alternative to the Lord. But at another dimension, which many of our Christian scholars don't when they make accusations like Christian national. And that is, in the old days, nation was a threat to local. Today, global is a threat to both the local and the nation. And so many of those scholars who hate nationalism are actually reflecting an unwise globalism without thinking about it. So, bizarrely, I've been accused of being a Christian nationalist because I defend America. I'm not American even, but that's absurd. I think I do defend the best of America rooted in the Sinai Revolution from Exodus. But I'm not American, and it's certainly not a, I've written on civil religion, which is idolatry. And so I do think Lincoln went overboard sometimes, the way he put it. But you can see that when Calvin put Covenant and then Zwingli and Bullinger and Knox, that notion became constitution. So Americans ought to know their history because the American Revolution owes everything to Exodus. And it's the richness of that we've lost today. So Constitution today is only law. And you can see how, you know, even the Supreme Court protesters now are saying, abort the court. That is a cute little slogan to them, but it's a disaster because it undermines constitutional understanding and covenantal understanding. And Christians should be standing for it and realizing where it comes from. And it's much, much richer than just law and law courts. Let me challenge you or push you on this idea that the U.S. Constitution is a covenant because one of the defining features of the U.S. Constitution is its lack of an established religion. So never is a church named or set up. That's not what we're talking about. The Jewish covenant was a covenant with God as a partner. Right. The American one at best is we the people, it's still a covenant. Because you can trace how that the Mayfire Compact was a covenant. John Winthrop on the Arbella was talking about covenant. When John Adams wrote the first written constitution in the U.S., the Commonwealth of Massachusetts, what does he call it? A covenant. That idea is there. Now, the American constitution at best is under God, not with God. So, of course, America is not formally, officially, nationally an established Christian country, of course. But still the notion of constitution comes from covenant. I see. So it's a, it's a covenant with one another, not a covenant with God. But you said it's under God. And we, we do see that terminology in a lot of American you know, imagery and, um, and, and our phrasing of our national identity and so forth. What is that, as an outsider, what would you say that means under God? Well, Lincoln introduced it, and he got it from the preface to the King James Bible. And it meant just that, that God was the Lord finally over everything. And if you read Lincoln's story, when he was killed, they discovered a memo on his desk that begins with the words, the will of God prevails. So that was his wrestling in the second inaugural with the whole meaning of the carnage of the Civil War, two sides praying to the same God, etc., etc. And his 
and the will of God prevails. Now, here's the important point. Under God is quite different from God on our side. God on our side, the bishops blessing the bombers and all that sort of stuff, that's civil religion. Under God, God is sovereign. And of course, he judges as well as delivers. And there's no question that America is under judgment. I think pretty much everyone observing the current state of the country would, uh, who has a Christian background, would agree with that. It does seem to be a moment of judgment. Um, but as we look back to the Hebrew scriptures and we see God's continual cycle of judging and then calling back the people with prophets, what is that, you know, how does that bode for America's future? Are we redeemable in light of that? Or is it time to just, you know, kind of throw in the towel and start over again? The Lord's plans for America, I don't know, of course. But we are the people of faith here in America, and we've got to remedy the wrongs the same way we're called to in the Old Testament and the New Testament. In other words, the cross, like Yom Kippur, the Day of Atonement, is not purely individual. It is not purely spiritual. So even the word redeem, that's become spiritual and sort of rather a religious word. But if you look at the Old Testament, it's an officially mandated institutional mechanism for bailing out people in trouble. They were redeemed by their kinsman redeemer. And he had a legal social responsibility to rescue his cousins or whoever it was. And it, it was the Jewish way of making sure that people didn't slip through the safety net. It was a redeemer. And we've made it so super spiritual it's lost any toughness today. The same is true of atonement. Can Christians and Jews in America seek atonement? Well, they must, they can, and we've got to show them the way. In several of your books, you draw this sharp contrast between uh, a number of different revolutions, and you kind of identify them by their dates, right? So there's the American Revolution, or there's the English revolution, right? There's the American, the Russian, and the Chinese. And we look at these historically. And, and it's the French. E yeah, yeah, right, the French revolution. And we look at these historically and we say, um, you know, these are all fights for freedom against the old, or you're the ancien regime, you know, the old way of doing things. Um, but you see a very, very sharp contrast between the first two and the latter revolutions. Explain that for me. Well, people delight in the difference between the first two. The English failed, it's called the Lost Cause. The American obviously succeeded. But they're both not only English speaking, they're both rooted ultimately in Exodus. And that's the link. In other words, they're biblically rooted. And as I said, you know, she takes other, I, I, we talked about freedom or separation of powers, checks and balances, all these things, the, uh, they're all there in Exodus. The consent of the governed comes from Exodus. You can go on down the line. Whereas the French supremely, and then following it, the Russian and the Chinese are anti-Christian, anti-biblical, and anti-religious. You know, so Solzhenitsyn used to say that hatred of God and animosity to God is more essential and basic to say the radical left than even their politics and their economics. So we've got to be very, very careful when we look at the radical left today. There's an awful lot of naivety in the church about where the radical left comes from. Part of the uh, you know tension in the American scene right now, and you draw this out as well, is that the ideals of the French Revolution have really seeped into American politics and begun to color how we see the American Revolution and its ideals. If, if you were to have like a Robespierre up against a, you know, a George Washington or uh, an Alexander Hamilton, how would they clash? What, what's so different about these two men um, that, that leads you to place them on op opposite sides of history, as it were? Well, the American Revolution is fundamentally realistic about human nature. 
So freedom is always freedom within a framework. Whereas the French Revolution is utopian about human nature, following Jean-Jacques Rousseau, and so freedom is an ideal all by itself. Or you take something like equality. The American Revolution has a limited view of equality. We're created equally as children of God, but we're not equal in many ways. And if you make equality the great ideal, you'll end up destroying liberty. And you can see that equality by itself appeals to envy. Equality needs an umpire, and the umpire will always be the state, and you'll end up with authoritarianism. So there's an incredible naivety in a lot of particularly younger Christians and a lot, sadly, of pastors. And I've spoken to pastors and said to them bluntly, you, you brothers have drunk the Kool-Aid. In other words, someone says justice and they leap to their feet and salute. Whereas, yes, we both agree on injustice, but the biblical view of justice and the radical left view of justice are entirely different and they end up in two different destinations. This one value of the French Revolution, so they called it egalité, equality, um, has become the watchword of you know American revolutionaries, so to speak, the, the ones who want to recast the American founding. And yet there is a there is a Christian sense, like you say, in which equality can be affirmed. Help our, help my listeners understand very clearly why the American idea of equality is limited and um, how it contrasts with the French revolutionary idea of equality. Well, let's go back to Lincoln's famous definition of democracy. Government of the people, by the people, for the people. Democracy, equality of the citizenship. Now, many people don't realize Lincoln was quoting. He was actually quoting a pastor in Boston whose writings he'd been given a month or so earlier, but that pastor... It's nice of him to give him credit. That pastor was <laughs> quoting. And do you know who he was quoting? He was quoting John Wycliffe, the early reformer. And Wycliffe's idea was when people have the Bible, in other words, he was trying to see the Bible translated from Latin and so on into English for ordinary people like Tyndale did later. But when people have the Bible, they will have the basis of government by the people, for the people, and so on. In other words, you need a basis to be able to have some of these things, and that's what the Bible gives you. And so you have people like Rabbi Sachs who would argue that Judaism is the democratizing of ancient religions. So almost all ancient religions, you take Egypt, Babylon, and so on, they were hierarchical. You know, you look at the top stone of the pyramid or the top brick in the ziggurat, that was the pharaoh or the emperor. And the whole system supported them. And they ruled over the whole system, but not in the Jewish way. And you could see that there was a beginning. So, uh, what's it, Michael Walzer at Princeton calls Judaism an almost democracy through the covenant. Now we've got to recover some of these things. Democracy is literally impossible in its richest form without biblical understanding. I see an undercurrent, it's not huge, but I see an undercurrent on the American right uh, who is so tired of Western secularism that they look at a regime like you know, Vladimir Putin's in Russia and the nominal Christianity that reigns there. You know, you see Eastern Orthodox, Russian Orthodox priests blessing tanks and so forth. And, and it's all done in this declaratively Christian way. And they look at that and they say, that's the way we should be going. That's, you know, Christian nationalism as it, it, as it should be. Um, what's your attitude toward that approach? And is it valid? Is it? Um, no, it's disastrous. My enemy's enemy is not always my friend. In other words, the insanity, say, of the sexual revolution is flouting the way of the Lord openly. And Putin and Patriarch Kirill are using that in their ways of attacking the West. But they are the representation of authoritarianism and the worst of hierarchical 
government. So my enemy's enemy is not necessarily my friend. It may mean we have two enemies to combat on that sort of situation. But I think that notion of Euro, Euro-Asianism or the Third Rome or bringing together conservative Orthodox, conservative Catholics and conservative evangelicals is an absolute disaster because it can only end in authoritarianism. And remember, from the scriptures, we have two bookends. This is Reinhold Niebuhr. One, authoritarianism, all order, no freedom. And the other, anarchy, all freedom, no order. The biblical way is an ordered freedom, a covenantal freedom. And so you can see that in politics, whether it's secular Chinese or religious authoritarianism under Patriarch Kirill, we're against both of those. And we're also against the chaos of anarchy, which much of our Western thinking is leading towards. Now, the trouble is the more you, of the two extremes, anarchy is literally unlivable. That's Hobbes's point. When life is the war of all against all and life is nasty, brutish, and short, then you prepare to trade your freedom for some control. So you give your freedom to Leviathan, the growing state. So we resist authoritarianism. That's the radical left. But we know that when the West moves towards the chaos of anarchy, people will hunger for authoritarianism, sadly in the church too. And that's extremely dangerous. That, of course, is what happened in the 30s, you know, with the decadence of Weimar and rampant inflation. Christians hungered for control. And so many of them said yes to Hitler, who looked better than the decadence of CD liberalism. And of course, they paid for it. We must resist that too. When we speak of America representing something um, different from the authoritarian regimes, um, like you know Vladimir Putin's in Russia, I I have this misgiving that arises in my mind, mainly as a result of conversations with very devoted, um, conservative-minded Protestants who say, "Well, you know, the American project." was flawed from the very beginning because we didn't acknowledge Christ as Lord of our nation. We, we didn't establish any religion. We didn't set up, um, you know, an explicit covenant with God and men like Thomas Jefferson, our third president looked at the French revolution, for instance, with, with some degree of admiration. And then we've got figures like Thomas Paine with common sense and so forth. There's like this enlightenment, almost French current in the American revolution. What would you say to the idea that America was sort of poisoned or corrupted from the beginning by a secular mindset? Well, everything we do is corrupt in that sense. I'm fallen, you're fallen. Yeah. So every project, including your podcast, is flawed <laughs> from the beginning. It's bound to be. Don't we know it? Because we are. And that's the truth of that. Now, the way you express their saying it is wrong. Jefferson was the founding father most enamored by the revolution. You're right. But before he became president, he saw the problems. All the others, remember Thomas Paine wasn't a founding father. All the others, without exception, saw the problems of the French Revolution very, very clearly. And Jefferson renounced it before he became president. So that's important. In other words, they all had that notion of an ordered freedom. But when you say, are we defending America? America today is not what she was. She was never perfect. But I think the best of the ideal of what they were doing is incredible. So I'm partly English. The English Revolution failed. There were a lot of incredible ideas. But after it failed, the best we did was nonconformist conscience and then people like Wilberforce and so on. But we've never had a nationwide movement where the faith really shaped political life in that way. Whereas here, I would say you had an imperfect, flawed, yes, but you had the most nearly perfect expression of some of these Old Testament ideas. Now, we've abandoned them. 
So I put it this way, we're at a civilizational moment. America, the West at large, has abandoned the faith that made the West. That's why the West is declining. We're a cut flower civilization. But America has done something even worse. It has abandoned the faith that made it and abandoned the revolution that made it. So America is going downhill very rapidly. And with American freedom, you know, as many scholars point out, and I'm not a scholar, but they point out Europe always has something of tradition that holds you together. And it has social cohesion. If you live in a small village or a small town, there's much more accountability. America has no tradition, no social cohesion. Freedom, 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 mobility, mobility. So when America goes to seed, America will go to seed very fast and very disastrously. And that's what we're seeing. You speak of the, the West as having you know Christian underpinnings and having cut those off so that we are like a cut flower civilization. I just finished a, a couple of Chesterton's best known books. So in um, Orthodoxy in particular, he refers to Europe as the faith, almost as if it's, you know, a European faith. And he, there's, there's a sign, you know, the signs he recognizes that Christianity transcends Europe, but he also relates them very closely on a historical level. He's writing over a hundred years ago. If he could see the way things are now, what do you think he would say about our civilization and, you know, this cut flower mm -hmm. idea? How, how much time do we have yeah. left? Well, Chesterton was actually going along quoting, I think, Hilaire Belloc, who was the one who talked about the faith like that. And that's understandable. The West owes a lot to Greece and Rome and Israel. But what made the West was the conversion of the barbarian kingdoms from the 5th to the 10th century. So the West is the child of Christendom. And I don't just mean the Holy Roman Empire. I mean the Christian consensus over 2,000 years, including the Reformation. So the West owes everything to the gospel, but the Enlightenment rose up to knock that out and to claim to be the power. So if we had more time, I think our main challenge is Enlightenment secularism. But we've now got various movements. I call them the red wave, the black wave, the rainbow wave, and the gold wave, which are ideologies which are not only against the Christian faith, they're against the West. And that is the new thing you can see. There is a Western war on the West. Douglas Murray's latest book has picked up a little of that. That's why we're in such an extraordinary moment and why it's so important for Christians to let God be God and we have to live Christianly in this extraordinary hour. What do you think about the inevitability of decline thesis, the, the sort of idea that once you pass a juncture as a people, as a nation, there's just no going back. There's no redemption. Are we past that? Are we coming up to it? You've got two conflicting mentalities and not even philosophies. You've got the master of history mentality. You know, we can always do it. We put a man on the moon, we can overcome this. And that optimism, the best is yet to be and all that. Then you've got the monitors of the cycles, I call it, those who know all about Spengler and Toynbee and Sorokin and Reef and people like this. Now they tend, if you look at all the cycles of the rise and fall, you tend to be pessimistic. But that's not Christian either. In other words, Jewish and Christian faiths are unique because they believe in freedom, not fate. So nothing is determined. The one thing we know nothing about is what will happen tomorrow. Now, if the Lord is sovereign, we're not sovereign like he is, but we are significant and free. So deterministic decline, that's not Christian either. And obviously the answer to that is the Lord is the Lord of creation and therefore of recreation. So you take the Valley of the Tribones, you take the first awakening, the second awakening. England in 1735 was decadent, 
corrupt, violent. And then, under Wesley, Whitfield, and people like that, a massive awakening. And you had the greatness of the Victorian era at its best, Wilberforce and many, many others. Right. And that's possible tomorrow. So I'm not a declinist. That is not a Christian position. Hmm. If someone's listening and they think to themselves, well, you know, Oz is telling us to lean into the culture war, that what we're doing no, here is moment. going to Im- <laughs> is going to result in success. What, what, do we, what does the culture war miss? What do we need to be doing that we're not doing? Well, engaging politics, we've got to do it Christianly. So you know the old 19th century slogan, do the Lord's work in the Lord's way. So the means must serve the ends. So there's a thousand examples of that. But you take, say, the social media today, the biblical view of words, words create worlds, words destroy worlds. So you've got to use words with great, great care and responsibility. But with the social media, brief, instantaneous, in reaction, emotionally responsive, you can see how many Christians in that very simple little thing alone are very unbiblical the way they're engaging public life. So the reformation of America must include the reformation of American language, which is vile at the moment. You know, I I wrote a a short series of op-eds as letters to Mr. Trump if he was considering running again. And no paper would publish them, but one of them was on language. And I challenged him to ask his own son-in-law and daughter what the orthodox view of words is. Because what Trump did was what's called evil speech in the Old Testament. And Christians have indulged in that. That's only one tiny thing. We've got to do the Lord's work in the Lord's way. And you can see people like Wilberforce were very, very different. So we've got great examples. You know, Wilberforce, Lord Shaftesbury, great politicians who had incredible impact and were deeply faithful the way they did their politics. Whereas, say, evangelicalism today has become toxic because we've shamed the name of the Lord by the way we've been politicized. Oz, let me let me press you on that because I share a a real disappointment with the way that you know President Trump spoke and conducted himself and used you know language and the especially the power of the office, the bully pulpit. Um, but there are a lot of Christians out there who would look at the current state of the Supreme Court, right, and the likely overturning of Roe v. Wade, for instance, and say, well, see, you know, the means were worth it. And I'm not asking, you know, about voting for Trump or anything like that. That's not what this podcast is for. I'm asking about um, this idea that the means can corrupt the end. How would you respond to someone who, who says, well, look, we're saving lives because we just don't care too much. We're not delicate enough to care about language and petty concerns like that. Yeah, now, what I'm saying about politicization is either side. So the never-Trumpers were often as bad as the pro-Trumpers. Now, whoever you support, you support critically. In other words, I know many people. I'm not American, so I didn't vote. But my own wife, she admired many, many of Trump's policies, infinitely better than President Biden's. But people who supported his policy should have said, Mr. President, make sure you're speaking the truth, no lies. He's a habitual liar. He's not the only one. You have people on the other side, chronic liars too, far too many in America. But they should have said, Mr. President, yes to this, yes to that, yes to the other. But humility. You think of, say, Rick Warren's great opening line of his bestseller, it's not about you. So great leaders in the scriptures are servant leaders. And that was introduced not by the Buddhists through Greenleaf's idea. That came through Moses. I think 19 or 20 times he's called a servant. Pharaoh would never have been a servant. The whole of Egypt was there to serve him. Mr. President, you are serving America. It's not about you. And so Christians should have supported him but also had the guts to challenge him where he was very wrong. 
you are a, a just a very strong advocate of the ideal of religious freedom, of, of the freedom of conscience, and you see that as a sort of special patrimony of the American experiment. And yet, and, and I alluded to this earlier, when we look back at the Israelite theocracy, religious freedom was the, you know, the furthest thing from that project. Now, progressives who hear this conversation would easily get the idea that we are calling for like a theocracy in America. How would you differentiate that from the Hebrew theocracy? You know, where, do you, where does this idea of freedom of religion come from? Now, the, the Jews would reject the idea that theirs was a theocracy. And you may know that word was introduced, I think, by, was it Josephus or Philo? I can't remember mm, which. Okay. Much later were, scholar. They, yeah. We were trying to explain Judaism was not like the big three in Greece, monarchy, aristocracy, democracy. It was different. And whether it was Josephus or Philo, they reached for a word and called it theocracy. But the Jews rightly say that's wrong. Theocracy has become the rule of the priests and another form of authoritarianism. What Judaism was, as Rabbi Sachs puts it, a nomocracy. Now, it was the rule of law, but remember, they had voluntarily accepted it, the consent of the government. It's a nomocracy where we, the people, put it in, in modern terms, are signing on to this. So it's not a theocracy as it's criticized. But also remember a second thing. For Judaism, and I think for Christians too, God is sovereign. He is free to enter everywhere in the world except one place, the human heart. And the Lord has left the human heart free even to choose against him. You think of the fall and so on. And that's incredibly important. Yeah, I mean, a, an evangelical version of that is Holman Hunt's painting, The Light of the World. Jesus knocking at the door, no handle, on the outside. Why? We are each free to make that choice in our heart. Now, freedom of conscience is the inner forum of absolute freedom. What someone thinks is true and right and good, freedom of conscience. And because they're, they're not free, they're bound by the dictates of their conscience, it's respected. So when you have freedom of conscience, the inner forum, and then you have a civil public square in public life, you have the two forums that are essential for genuine free societies. And that's why I defend it. Now we've got to fill it out. Yeah. As we, we're coming to the end of our time here, Oz, and I, I've really enjoyed this. I mean, we were just running down every rabbit trail imaginable because there's so many questions I have for you. But as, as we close here, I'm thinking of the story of Abraham and uh, Sodom and Gomorrah and his intercession on behalf of those cities. And obviously those are, you know, like spectacularly wicked cities and we get a little taste of how wicked they are. But there are certain parallels and you can point to them and say, that's similar to what's happening here. That reminds me of our, the state of our culture and our civilization. And yet God in his mercy was willing to spare those cities of the plains for a very tiny number of righteous people if Abraham could find them. Do you think we can learn from that in our situation? And then how many people, and I'm not asking for exact number, but what should be our attitude toward this righteous minority um, and the hope that it gives our nation and in light of God's mercy? Mm -hmm. Well, you have the biblical notion of remnant right through the Old Testament. And the Jews have a notion of the just men. I think if you have 12 just men, the world will be saved and so on. Now, but I think the story of Abraham's important for another reason. You know, the Jews say, why on earth did the Lord call Abraham? And we're not really told. You know the little old poem, how odd of God to choose the Jews which was once the shortest poem in the English language. The Bible barely tells us, except I think it's Genesis 17 or 19. It says, I've called Abraham that he, he may pass on generation to generation and represent my righteousness and justice. So parenting and stands for justice are at the heart of what he was about. 
And when the Lord tells Abraham he's about to judge Sodom and Gomorrah, the Jews understand that. He was inviting Abraham to take a stand on behalf of justice. Shall not the judge of all the earth do right? In other words, we who follow the Lord are called to be agents of justice, and we must be. So I critique the radical left totally because their views of justice end in oppression and disaster. But that doesn't mean we sit back. We should be better. Thank God for people like Bartolome Las Casas or Wilberforce, whoever. Evangelicals today should be more agents of justice than the radical left. And I think we've got to learn the lesson of Abraham and Solomon and Gomorrah pleading with the Lord. You know, the Jews have a notion of argument on behalf of heaven. You can argue with the Lord so long as you're arguing on behalf of his creation. It's a wonderful idea. And that's what Abraham was doing. And we should do the same. So if you look in history, one of the great mysteries of history, why didn't humans speak against injustice and oppression? And the main reason given, answer given, is power. In other words, power is spectacular. It can be a runner like Usain Bolt. It can be military power like Alexander the Great. Power is spectacular, and humans are impressed and bow. The first great voices to stand against power and therefore oppression are the prophets. Amos, Micah, Hosea, Isaiah, Jeremiah. That's our tradition, and of course, the Messiah. The good news of Jesus. Today in your hearing, the Lord says, this scripture is being fulfilled. We should be advancing the kingdom, bearers of the good news. We need to recover the evangelicalism of the evangelicals, you know, and be agents of justice and freedom. What would be the sign of, and this is the last question, what would be the sign of a nation redeemed? How do we know we've turned a corner and averted judgment? Or, or, or is that something we can even know? I wouldn't put it like that. I'd put it more each of us recovering our faith and living it out fully so that we are salty and light bearing individually and then collectively. And we would have an incredible impact on a nation. You know, my great grandfather at the age of 23 was one of the leading preachers in the Irish revival. And we have newspaper accounts of him standing, no microphone, standing on the top of a carriage talking to 25,000 people. Now, in the year after the revival in that part of Ireland, there was only one recorded crime. In other words, when the gospel really touches its spiritual conviction of sin, transformation of lives, and then ethical transformation and social transformation, you think of all the things exploded under the evangelical awakening, Wesley Whitfield, Wilberforce, and so on. Incredible ripples flowed out. So I can't say I know what a redeemed nation would be, but you know when the gospel is lived out, it has profound national, social transformations as a consequence. Well, my guest today has been Oz Guinness, author, social critic, and one of our speakers at this year's William Wilberforce Weekend in Orlando, Florida. Oz, thanks so much for joining me today on Upstream. I really enjoyed this conversation. I did too. Thanks, Shane.